My name is Dick Cooper. I'm a native of Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, started out as a, a journalist, spent a decade working with papers like the Birmingham Post Herald, the Decatur Daily, uh, and the Florence Times Tri-Cities Daily. Uh, got into the music business in 1975, and since that time I've worked with a variety of artists, everybody from uh, Etta James to Bob Dylan to Stephen Stills and a lot of prominent names in the music industry. Uh, I had heard rumors that there was music being made in muscle shows uh, as early as the 62-63 oh, era, but I, I didn't believe them. I thought that was uh, just a rumor. Uh, and then uh, when Percy Sledge uh, cut When a Man Loves a Woman, I saw uh, a, a newscaster mention it on a local television station. And that's when I started pretty much paying attention to it and realizing it actually was happening in the muscle shows, which seemed really strange, to be honest about it. Ended up coming to the Florence Times Tri-Cities Daily in 1972. The first week I was here, about Wednesday afternoon, I'm, I'm like really you know, pulling my hair out because I don't know anything about the town, and I've got to write a feature story for the next day. And I'm sitting at my desk uh, trying to figure out something to do, and one of the uh, photographers walked through and he asked me what was wrong. Uh, his name was Rayburn Sparks, and uh, I told Rayburn that I was trying to find a subject matter for my Sunday column. He said, well, you want to go to a session? And I said, what's that? And uh, he took me to fame, and I watched Mike Davis cut Baby Don't Get Hooked on Me, which was the number one record eventually. Uh, at first, you know, I did just a couple of, you know, feature stories, but then became aware that if I started a column about what was happening in the music industry, that took care of my Sunday feature requirement, and it also gave me a license to hang out at the studios. So I did that for three and a half years, writing about uh, all the different artists that were coming through, uh, reporting on how the records they created were faring in the uh, charts and whatnot, and, and just generally talking about the growing music industry in, in the town at that point. One of the most uh, fortunate things that happened to me while I was writing the music column was uh, being introduced to Jerry Wexler. He had been a, a journalist uh, himself when he got gotten started. He had worked for Billboard magazine. He was the person that created the term rhythm and blues. He ended up uh, working with uh, Billboard until the early 50s, at which point he left there and went to work with uh, Atlantic Records and be eventually becoming one of the vice presidents of that company. He created uh, the careers of people like Aretha Franklin, and he helped uh, many, many artists uh, in a whole variety of ways. Uh, he helped build Stax Records in Memphis. He certainly helped build Muscle Shoals music uh, industry here by picking up, first of all, Percy Sledge's When a Man Loves a Woman and turning that into a big hit. He was, uh, in many ways, my mentor. He basically was the person who encouraged me to get into the music business. I told him I didn't have any background for it, and he says, nobody else does either. Just do the work, and, you know. So, yeah, he was extremely important, not only to Muscle Shows music in general, but to me personally. Well, Jerry was just such an iconic individual that people just would do anything to work with him. Uh, Bob Dylan was that way. Bob uh, agreed to co-produce a uh, Barry Greenberg album that Jerry was going to uh, produce, and uh, they're cutting the record, and Bob has driven in from L.A., he and his wife and two boys, and, uh, in a panel van. It's a real secretive session simply because of Bob being there. And uh, I couldn't go in. I was basically relegated to the parking lot. But uh, Jerry made sure that I was introduced and whatnot. And uh, we ended up with a great photograph that was on the album uh, cover. But Bob wouldn't uh, participate in the photograph. And he asked me, he said, please don't take any photos of me. 
So anyway, I'm, I'm hanging out in the parking lot and Wexler comes up to me and says, how come you ain't in there shooting pictures? And I said, well, Bob asked me not to. He said, this is Bob Dylan. Get in there and shoot pictures. And so I sneak into the vocal booth, which is, doesn't have the light on in it, and I stood on the uh, stool that singers normally would sit on in the dark room and shot a couple of shots of Bob. And to be honest, they were really terrible. I mean, you know, it was far from being the optimum uh, situation to be in. And I did the best I could, but the reality was you, you just couldn't get away with it. it. It just wasn't happening. Jerry was still satisfied. At least I gave it the, the try, you know. Then Bob came back a couple of times later to work with Jerry again, this time as an artist. I ended up uh, being offered the job of managing editor of the paper. I had, uh, had come up through the ranks, so to speak. I'd been made the city editor, but even when I was city editor, they allowed me to do my music column. But when they wanted me to become the managing editor, they weren't gonna let me do my music column any longer. So I quit the paper instead of taking the managing editor's position. I literally turned down a $35,000 a year job so I could hang out at the studio and go to the line and get beer for tips. And it was without question the best decision I ever made in my life. I also started doing promo packs for bands, uh, photographs, uh, writing promo pieces, working as a freelance journalist in the music uh, industry trades. And um, as a result of that, I ended up getting a job working with Pete Carr and his band LeBlanc Carr. And went out on the road with them as their road manager. We traveled uh, quite a bit. We uh, unfortunately were the uh, opening act for Leonard Skinner in 1977. And uh, we were opening the shows immediately prior to the plane crash that uh, devastated that band. And uh, at that point in time, uh, I went across town to Muscle Shell Sound because I knew where I wanted to work. There wasn't any question in my mind that I wanted to work for Barry Beckett. And so I go over to Muscle Shell Sound and I was hired and worked there for two and a half years until Barry decided to go to Nashville. Actually, no, I think it was five and a half years. Anyway, I worked there for a long time. And um, in that course of that time, we did two Bob Dylan albums and we did uh, uh, McGuinn Hillman, we did John Prine, we did Frankie Miller, which is a Scottish singer. We had uh, quite a run there before he decided to go to Nashville and do country music. When I first came here, there were eight studios. And when you really get, start digging, they were studios here as early as 1950, you know. Dexter Johnson built a studio in his garage and started making records in 1950. And so, yeah, that was one studio in 1950. And today, there's no telling how many studios are here. I would suggest that a, an accurate count would be in the neighborhood of 75 to 100. So I think that's probably the biggest change.